Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. And we pray that as we come together today to think about uh, your servant Daniel, that you will speak to us and uh, that you will remind us that you are in control, that you are sovereign and uh, you rule over the nations. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. What's that? Was it Washington? Oh, that's better. There you go. That makes sense. Hang on a minute. my preaching glasses. So he said, you're not going to understand what, what I'm doing right now when I'm washing your feet. And uh, so today what I wanted to do, last week we talked about Joseph, and I kind of gave a whole overview of Joseph's life. And I want to do that with Daniel again, because these are two amazing people. They did everything right. Now, we know they weren't perfect, because all of sin had fallen short of the glory of God. But really, it's hard to find two people in the Bible that didn't make any mistakes, but these two, that no, nothing's really chronicled of a mistake that they made. So if we could just think a little bit about Daniel, just being this young kid, probably, uh, so he, he was very uh, affluent. He was a prince, a young prince, and living in luxury and just had this real favored, easy life. And then all of a sudden, the Babylonians come in. And in a single day, he's made a slave. And he goes from being the top of his society to being really brutally treated and uh, forced to go on this long march. Probably at the end of the march, he was made a eunuch. That's no fun. To say that, well, let me say it. I could say it because it's first service, but that's a job you really have to be cut out for. I have uh, beautiful graphics, but they're just like this. It's like a flannel board now. So I'm going to... Uh, so imagine how this turned his life around. And now all of a sudden he's in a school for like a foreign school. And he's in the school, it would be the Harvard of Babylon. They were looking for people that were of, of uh, the line of the king, that were especially intelligent, and were good students and good looking. I mean, this guy had everything. He was doing great. And then he ended up, uh, ended up total loss. Now, it's interesting, too, what you were talking about, who rules. When you look at Daniel, uh, the book of Daniel, it is really, the major premise is that God rules all the nations. You see it in, you see it in each of his dealing with a different king. Uh, the one message these kings get is they're there by God's grace and his plan, and he can bring them up or tail them down as he wills. God is sovereign in control. And then you see this, the, the way that book is written, it's like uh, two halves. The first half, I think, is written in uh, Hebrew, and the second half is written in Aramaic. And the second half is written in this uh, apocalyptic style like Revelation. But so here, Daniel had done nothing wrong, and he's forced into the school. It was a three-year training time when they would really try to indoctrinate and make the children of foreign countries to, to act and think like Babylonians. And they're going to use them to translate and, and to eventually assist the king. But the king was very harsh. At one time, remember, he decided uh, he had this dream and if none of the wise men could read his dream or explain his dream to them, they'd all die. So life was very cheap in Babylon unless you were the, the king Nebuchadnezzar. And so, you know, I really wish I could show you this. This is all bright blue. This is the intimidating place these guys came into. I wonder if I'll get this going. And, and uh, these walls, in fact, I was able to go and see these walls in Germany in uh, some uh, museum, famous museum in Germany, whose name I never knew when I was there because I didn't speak German. But so you can imagine these young guys coming in, just being fully intimidated. And yet they weren't so intimidated because remember, uh, one thing they did was they had a few of them. This is what I think is so key. 
is I think if it had just been one, remember it was Daniel and his three buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and to bed we go, something like that. But they were, but they were, they were not so intimidated that Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the king's with the food from the king's table. And right there, that stand that he took, and then his buddies took it with him, it really set the course of their lives. The king that they would serve would end up going back two more times to Jerusalem, and he would totally decimate it. The great temple that Solomon had built would be completely destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. This is the king that he would owe his allegiance to. And this was also something none of them wanted. I think as Jeremiah said, now you are going to be taken captive, and now you need to pray for that nation, because as that nation does well, you'll do well. So your fortunes are tied to this nation who has decimated your home country, and now you have to be slaves. So it turns out before Nebuchadnezzar's ruling was to destroy all the wise men, Daniel steps up and he says, wait, I'll tell you your dream. So Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't even say what the dream was. And so he says, uh, Daniel, can you tell me this dream? And Daniel says, no, I can't do that. But God can do that. And so he then he explained the, the statue. You guys will remember the statue with a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. And this, uh, he explained to uh, Nebuchadnezzar that this was the, the fallen kingdoms that would come right after him. And uh, when he told the, you know, when you have a, when you have a, a prophecy that's not going to be confirmed for a while, <laughs> there's really no way to know it except for what convinced Nebuchadnezzar is that Daniel could tell him the dream even before it was fulfilled. And so uh, these, these young men ended up passing their school exams at the end. They were actual oral exams with the king himself. And it said these, these three, these four guys knew the Babylonian system and everything they had studied ten times better than anybody else. So God really rewarded them, even though they were in a situation that it looked like there was no good reason why they were there. Then you'll remember, we don't know if, uh, if Daniel was maybe being, uh, acting as an ambassador somewhere, but the next part of the story, he's not really there, and it's just Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the king gets this idea, hey, let's make that statue look like me. <laughs> and he builds a statue of gold, and he says, look, when you hear the music, everybody bow down. And three of them wouldn't bow down. And then you remember he was so angry and he said, look, if you will play it again, just bow down this time, I'll spare your lives. And they said, no, we will not bow down. The God we serve can deliver us. And even if he doesn't, then you'll know that I'm not, we are not going to worship your idols. Remember this story? He gets, a, he gets enraged and he fires up the furnace hotter than it's ever been before so that the people who bound them up and threw them into the furnace, their best soldiers, they get, he got his best soldiers, and they burned up trying to get him into the furnace. And it's a remarkable story, right? Because then the king looks in. At, what's that? They did get consumed. In fact, he, he, he sees them walking around in there. And then he sees there's not just three, there's four. And he's asking his subjects, Wer, weren't there three we put in there? And then he says, I see a fourth one. It looks like the Son of God. We call that a Christophany. When, when Jesus appears, it's very likely that it was Jesus who walked with them, with Adam and Eve in the garden. But he's a word made flesh, and sometimes, miraculously, uh, he shows up in the pages of the Old Testament. And so when they came out, they didn't even smell of fire. They weren't even singed. The only thing that was burnt was the ropes that bound them, burnt off. So God delivered, even though they said, even if he doesn't deliver us, you'll know that your gold and your idols are not our God. But they ended up, I mean, what a scary thing to be thrown into a furnace. And they were willing to die for that. And God miraculously interceded. Then the next thing, of course, uh, you might remember that uh, Daniel, uh, 
the king gets another dream, and it's a uh, tree that sprouts up, and then it becomes a stump, <laughs> and the dream, uh, Daniel says to, to uh, boy, I just said his name. What's the king's name? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, thank you. He says, that dream's about you because you're so prideful and arrogant. I'm gonna, the Lord's going to show you. He's going to take away your sanity for seven years, and you're going to eat grass like an ox, and your hair's going to grow long, and your, your nails are going to grow like claws of a bird. And he says, next time you manifest this, this pride, that's what's going to happen. And so sure enough, he's out looking at his, at his kingdom. He goes, this is the great kingdom of Babylon that I have made. And he loses his sanity. And for seven years... And I want to read to you, uh, at the end of the seven years, his sanity returns, and uh, God got his attention. <laughs> and so many times you see that, that God uses Daniel to bring these kings into an awareness that they have to answer to God. And, and so this is Nebuchadnezzar being quoted in Daniel, and he says, At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven. My sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is eternal, is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to gener generation. All the people of, peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me and the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. This is a pagan king. That brought, uh, that brought the, the really, as terrible as it was, this enslavement of, of the Jews, it's what preserved them. And God miraculously restored them back again. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's son then uh, is, is even worse and, and more terrible than his father, much less responsible. And remember, he had this big banquet, and he just uh, had no regard for the God of Israel, and he took the holy uh, articles that had been taken out of the temple, and he used them just to have a party. <laughs> and so he's drinking and being wild, and then all of a sudden he sees this amazing vision. Remember this? The hand, a human hand appears, and it's writing on the walls, and it's, what's it, mini, mini, tekel, parson? I don't know if I said that right, but nobody could read it. So, so the, then the queen said, well, we know one who can get the Hebrew in here. And they bring Daniel in, and he says, look, if you can read this, I'll make you second to me. I mean, his knees were knocking. He was so afraid. This king uh, was completely afraid. And then Daniel tells him the vision. He says, uh, Mini, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the scales and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the, and the Persians. And so that's exactly what happened. And then the Persian king comes in, Darius, and uh, it takes it, uh, the Medes and the Persian take over Babylon in one day. Just a surprise attack. History is a little bit obscure. Some people think that they hated the king so much that his own people opened the gates and let him in. But in a day, there was a whole new regime and a whole new people. And Darius was the king. And so he, had, he took this, the, the cabinet, he had his, the same cabinet, and he said, uh, I'm going to put 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom and three administrators to rule over them, and Daniel was one of them. Daniel was the best. Now Daniel is elevated to the very top. Everything's going great for Daniel. But the other rulers get jealous. And they say, how can we possibly uh, trip Daniel up? We've got to, can you imagine people getting jealous of power and government? <laughs> Could never happen. No. So they decide to, 
uh, Daniel had distinguished himself, and it was looking like the king was going to put him second in charge. And so they, the uh, other rulers came up with a plan. They get Darius, oh, uh, may you never die, king, may you never die. May the king live forever. And they say, why don't you make a law? We've all gotten together. It'd be a good law that nobody can pray to any other god but you, the king, for 30 days. No other prayers are going to go up except to you. And the pride of this man said, okay, let's make it a law. A law of the Medes and the Persians, they keep saying, they can never be changed, they can never be changed. The Babylonian law, the king could just change it. But the Medes and the Persians, they wouldn't let him change it. So once the king wrote it, uh, guess what? Then Daniel knew that the, the law was enacted, and he did what he did every day, which he opened up the windows to Jerusalem, and he prayed so anybody could see him. And he did that that evening, even though he knew the law was there. And so they, uh, they had spies already watching him, waiting for him to do what they knew he would do. In fact, he says, uh, it says even better, he, not only did he pray with this law was against him, but it says three times a day he got down on his knees, this is what he always did, and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. So now he had the law against him, it looks like it's going to be a capital crime. They're going to throw him in the lion's den. Why did Daniel go into the lion's den? We all know he was in the lion's den. Why did he go into the lion's den? For praying when it was made illegal to pray. This could happen here. <laughs> right? And it, and it happens all across. It's happening right now. Uh, it's happening right now in Babylon. Isn't that amazing? So... Uh, God does not always promise to intervene, but for Daniel, he intervened. And the king was so frustrated that he was trapped up in this law. He spent the whole night. He, the Medes and the Persians had strong laws and weak lawyers because they couldn't get a law to, they couldn't get away out of the law. So the king uh, put Daniel in the lion's den, and then he just waited and fretted and didn't even sleep that night. Next day, early in the morning, the king runs to the den of the hungry lions. Did your God protect you? And Daniel answered back. And so he rejoiced. They, they actually had to bring this old man up. This, by this time, he's about 70 years old. And they bring this up, old man up out of the lion's den, and the king is, just rejoices to see him, King Darius. And then he takes the other rulers that picked up this plan, he throws them in the, in the, with the lions, with their families, <laughs> their wives and children, and before they hit the ground, the lions consumed them and busted their bones. Can you believe it? Uh, an angel kept the, the lions at bay and closed their mouths. Then Darius, this next regime, this next king, uh, after this he says, uh, he, he makes a decree uh, King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he, sla and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So this is the next great decree of the, of the greatest, strongest king in the known world at that time. Another amazing thing. So, so Daniel went from being on the top to being in the lion's den. He had to be thinking, Lord, what's going on? It was no punishment. It was, it was God was being with him because he had done what was right. Another thing, and you might like take out your Bibles if you want to find a Bible nearby, because this is so good to see. I think this is, uh, so this is Daniel 9, 25 through 27. So the second half of the book of Daniel reads like Revelation. But this is so amazing what this vision that he had. And if you look at, so you're looking at Daniel 9, 27, or, or 25. And we're going to jump down to 26 after. Well, we'll read. Let's read the whole thing. So it says, Know therefore and understand 
that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So what he's saying here is there's going to be a command. It hasn't happened yet. The next king is going to, Cyrus, is going to make a command and he's going to tell the people of Israel that they can go back and rebuild their wall and rebuild their temple. And he says from that time on, there's going to be this number of weeks and there's different ways that people uh, read those weeks, but here's what you can't mistake. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah, this is verse 23, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Now that cut off, it's just like Isaiah 53 when it says he was cut off from the land of the living. So it's saying that Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, not anything he did, but for everyone else. So Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of all this will be with a food, uh, with a, the end of this will be a flood until the end of the war, desolations are determined. So, look what he's saying here. He's saying, by the time that the Messiah is going to come and be cut off, before the sanctuary is destroyed, 70 AD. See what an amazing prophecy this is? Then he shall confirm a covenant with many, and some translations say, renew the covenant with many, for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and the offering. So after the, after the sanctuary was destroyed in 70 AD, then they haven't made an offering. The Jews haven't made an offering since that time. So consider this. How can this prophecy, in fact, I'm going to read to you, uh, this is from Jews for Jesus, a little commentary on this passage on the internet. It says, based upon this verse, it is also clear that the Messiah should have both come and died prior to 70 AD. If such an event did not take place, then Daniel was a false prophet. If such an event did occur, then the question must be answered, who was that Messiah who was killed before 70 AD? Isn't that amazing? So you wonder how the Jews even read this today. You know, the New Testament tells us that a veil covers their eyes. So we've all been blessed. We're blessed by this prophecy of Daniel. The nations were blessed by the proclamations of these kings, all because Daniel, doing nothing wrong, was made a slave. Does God work like that after Bible times? I got a great story because, and it's a true story. So I want you to think about I want you to think about the terror of being a young man taken into slavery, right? Here in our country, there's a young man, uh, probably a priestly line, who was taken and made a slave. Anybody know his name? Squanto, right? And uh, here he was just enjoying life, not necessarily doing anything wrong, and uh, 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 he had gotten familiar with English people, and so he was learning their language, learning their ways, and then they convinced him to come on the boat, and all of a sudden they hogtied him and made him a slave. They took him to Spain, and they sold him into slavery. Took him away from his family. He might have only been 12 years old. And so while he was a, when he was a slave, this is all before the pilgrims ever got here, when he was a slave, uh, he was bought, he was put on the block with all his buddies that were captured with him. He was put on the slave block, and the people who purchased him were compassionate monks that hated slavery. And they virtually bought him to treat him well. And so they taught him, uh, I suppose they taught him Sp Spanish. And he had already known some English. And so then he ended up uh, really wanted to go back home. He wanted to go back home. So they worked it out uh, that he would be, uh, he would get travel to a merchant in England because that's where the boats came back here. 
And so he, uh, it took him 10 years to finally find a boat that was going to the new world that he could, he could ride back on. And so he gets back here. And when he gets back, he goes to where his family was. And lo and behold, they're all gone. Disease has taken them out, wiped them out. I had a great quote. Oh, here it is. This is William Bradford. He was the first elected governor of, uh, off the Mayflower of the Pilgrims. And so the problem was the Pilgrims got end up being blown up north, and the Plymouth Rock was, guess what? It was right where the Indians that had been Squanto's tribe had lived. And that first winter, they were planning on going to, to uh, Virginia. When they spent that first winter, over half of them died. There was 102, and 51 survived. That first winter was so terrible. And they just didn't know how to work the land. They did not understand the land. And uh, after that first winter, all of a sudden, they hear broken English, and it's, a, it's an Indian who knew English, partly. And, and then he says, well, there's another Indian that speaks even better than me. He used to live with us. Now he just lives by himself. This man was just totally depressed. And so they introduce him. They, the pilgrims were introduced to Squanto, and then Squanto comes, and he teaches them. You might remember this from school. He teaches them how to plant the corn with the fish, how to catch the eels with their hands, Show him the different places, best places for hunting, because he, this was his hometown. Now, what's so interesting is then Bradford looks at this. He looks at this extraordinary life. All the, all the terrible things that happened to this man, he ended up bringing salvation to the pilgrims. So he writes in the, Plymouth, the history of the Plymouth settlement, he writes, Squanto stayed with them, and was their interpreter, meaning the pilgrims, and was their interpreter and was a special instrument sent of God for their good beyond their expectation. What did Jesus say? Right now you don't know what I'm doing, but you'll know. And this is, as we go through life, he goes, I'll read on here, he says, he showed them how to plant corn, where to take fish and other commodities, and guided them to unknown places and never left them till he died. And I was reading elsewhere that he actually stayed in the home of William Bradford. So they just had this bond, and he ended up being their chief diplomat because he made treaties with the Indians that lasted for 50 years, which it was really hard to get that going on before then. So when we look at our lives, there's times... <laughs> When we feel like we're in bondage, we're, we're, we're frustrated because of things that we want to see happen, that we're asking for, that we're pleading God for, they don't happen. And we have the promise of God that all things work together for our good, but it seems so impossible at times. But his vision's even farther than ours. I want to quote another from William Bradford. And I want you to think about this, because we think in terms of just when we live and when we die, and if it doesn't happen then, we think, well, what do we really do? But speaking of the pilgrims and how much they suffered, and he said, but these things did not dismay them, though they did sometimes trouble them, for their desires were set on the ways of God and to enjoy his ordinances. But they rested on his providence and knew whom they had believed. So the Bible says the one who promises is faithful. And then he says this. He says, the pilgrims cherished a great hope and inward zeal of laying good foundations. I was talking to Renee about this yesterday. And she said, do you think they would have come if they knew that half of them, half of their number would die that first year? And he says, the pilgrims cherished a great hope and an inward zeal of laying good foundations, or at least of making some way towards it for the propagation 
in advance of the gospel of the kingdom of Christ in its remote parts of the world, even though they should be but stepping stones to others in the performance of so great a work. This was their great hope. And now we find ourselves, as we think about Joseph, as we think about Daniel, as we think about Squanto, we think about Bradford, we are really the benefits of each of those stepping stones. It's quite remarkable that we have the gospel because of those and the apostles and whoever it is that has been carrying the gospel along. So I want us to think today, I guess this is a long way to get here. But as we think about Thanksgiving this week, I want us to think about are we being a stepping stone? And, it, and some of this, like what's great about the pilgrims, is they couldn't believe the freedoms that would come generations later when the Declaration was signed, when the Constitution was written, built on Christian law. They never saw that. They never saw that. So often we might say, you know what? Why do I even share my faith with anybody? Because they keep saying no. Wait a minute. <laughs> you might not see it. It might happen down the road. Somebody else might say something else that will add to what you said. Or even if you don't share the gospel, even if you just share the love of Christ, right? You don't, it, when you're a stepping stone, you don't know the result. But you know the one who promised is faithful. And we don't know what all he's doing, but a time will come when we will know. And, and we want, it will, there will be a time when we will see every step that we were a faithful stepping stone. I want to close in prayer and then invite Renee. She, she wrote a song about Squanto because she's a school teacher. No, she probably wrote that for church, huh? Uh, let's say a prayer. But you, would you go Father, we have been so blessed this Thanksgiving. Lord, there's a lot we could be thankful for. Maybe there's a lot of things we're fearful about. We don't know what the future holds, Lord, but we know who holds our future. And Lord, it's easy to feel like, oh, we're, we're losing so much of what we had. And that's true. And yet, we can be stepping stones. And Lord, each person that we share with, each person that we love, each person that we point in the right direction is precious to you, Lord. The angels rejoice when one repents and comes back to you. And it's not your desire that any would perish, but that all would repent and come to a knowledge of you, Lord. And so we have this short opportunity in this life, Lord, to be a stepping stone. And we ask that you would put it on our hearts, that you would make this the desire of our hearts. Lord, help us, not to, help us to fix our eyes on things which are eternal. Help us to, to ask you, Lord, that we would be, that, we, that you would permit us to be stepping stones, Lord. And Lord, when we feel like our life is uh, meaningless or obscure or taken in a direction we don't want, Lord, help us to know that you have, you're the one who's promised is faithful and that you'll never leave us or forsake us.